in a world where overspending, debt, and keeping up with the Joneses rules us all. Where the voices from the merchants, restaurants, and credit companies lord over the common man. Out of the darkness, like a beacon of hope, comes a new voice. A voice that's rich and creamy, like your favorite butter, and delicious, like cheeseburger pizza on your diet cheat day. It's The Stacking Benjamin Show. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's The Stacking Benjamin Show. Hey there, money nerds. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And looking at the crazy holiday calendar Joe's mom gave me, it appears today is Love Note Day. Well, consider this little podcast our love note to you because today we welcome to the basement Suze Ormain. What? What do you mean that's not how you pronounce it? Oh, uh, Susie? Okay, got it, got it. As I was saying... Susie Orman. Plus, in our headline segment, is popular stock trading app Robinhood selling users data to make the money they aren't making in trade commissions? We'll discuss. Plus, we'll throw out the Haven Lifeline to a lucky listener, dig into the mailbag, and deliver some of my love-themed trivia. And now, two guys who love Wednesday because that means Joe's mom serving ice cream with dinner... Joe and O-J-J-J-J-J-G. Ice cream. I have ice cream almost every night before bed. Yeah, but don't you like it when mom just adds that to dinner? Oh, yeah. When it's dinner instead of dinner, that's also really good. <laughs> Fantastic. Welcome, everybody, to the Wednesday uh, Ice Cream with Dinner podcast. I'm Joe Salcihai, just so you know which voice is which. And across the card table from me on a glorious Love Note Wednesday, Mr. OG. What's up? We have this little known person. Rotator chip. Little known person coming in with us today. Don't know if you've ever heard of this Orman person. What's that all about? Does she know what she's getting herself into? I think she has zero idea, but I can't wait. Okay. A new fan. I like it. It is. Yes. Yeah. Coming down to the basement. Susie upstairs talking to mom. Uh, you think she's bossing mom around? Yeah, probably. <laughs> but but mom's used to bossing other people around. I can't wait to see what happens there. Hey, and if you don't want your investments to boss you around, check out Emperor Investments. Thanks to Emperor Investments for supporting Stacking Benjamins. Investing can be complicated, And choosing the right equities can be daunting for even the most sophisticated investors. And that's why Emperor Investments, a new robo-investing platform, is offering Stacking Benjamin's listeners personalized all-equity portfolios free for six months. To take advantage of this exclusive offer, visit emperorinvestments.com forward slash SB and select Stacking Benjamin's podcast under How Did You Hear About Emperor during sign-up. Did you see uh, Frank in our basement Facebook group? Emperor sent him donuts. Like, hmm. don't like, don't get me wrong. Donuts are not a reason to invest money, but I just think it's a pretty cool thank you when you get donuts. Have you ever had a Hertz donut? Like, <laughs> you're so funny. There actually is in Fayetteville, Arkansas, there is a donut company called Hertz Donut. Hmm. Yes. So that's meta, isn't it? It might not Punched be in the arm every time you come in. <laughs> it's, 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 it's great. You get a donut and a salted. Yeah. At the same time, <laughs> we're also brought to you by magnify money. You know, the average person saves $450 when they shop for those financial products they use every day at magnify money. You know why they save $450? Cause the average person just walks into their bank and says, Hey, what do you got? Then they get inferior checking accounts, savings accounts, get out of debt products, mortgages, whatever it might be. Magnify Money has all those financial products in one place where you can easily compare, ditch, switch, and save a bunch of money. Head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash magnify money for more. We got a great show today. Susie Orman waiting upstairs with mom. But first we have some headlines and maybe a headline with a company doing something you might not think they're doing. So let's move. Hello, darlings. 
And now, it's time for your favorite part of the show, our Stacking Benjamin's Headlines. Our first piece today comes to us from Zero Hedge. This is a site, OG, that I like a lot, and we rarely get to talk about pieces from here online because it's it's an incredibly nerdy site, generally. Generally, they go in the weeds pretty deep at Zero Hedge. Hmm. This, this is written by Tyler Durden. Stealing from millennials to give to the rich, Robinhood app sells user customer data to make a quick buck from the high-frequency trading firms on Wall Street. Robinhood Financial, a U.S.-based mobile stock brokerage company, Founded on the basis of disrupting the brokerage industry by disrupting. Off- Gosh, I love that word. Disrupting the brokerage industry. We are going to disrupt this podcast. I'm just going to. I'm going to be disruptive this whole podcast. Yeah, thank you. By offering this is a dis- like right now. This is a disruptive podcast. Yes, isn't it? I'm going to continue to be disruptive all day by offering commission free trading has been secretly making millions of dollars in a profit scheme by selling users data. To high-frequency traders, said Logan Kane, a writer for North of Sunset Publishing. Kane said, the latest second quarter Securities and Exchange Commission filing shows that Robinhood Financial takes from the millennial and gives to the high-frequency trading firms. Quote, Robinhood accept payment for order flow, but on the back of the envelope calculation, they appear to be selling their customers' orders for over 10 times as much as other brokers who engage in the practice. It's a conflict of interest and is bad for you as a customer. Now, first of all, this is back of the envelope calculation. So does the person know for sure? Well, he does go on a little bit later in the article to to walk through the math and how they do it. But let's translate a little bit of that kind of stuff that we just talked about or that you just talked about there. Because I think about 90% of people listening went, huh, oh, oh, selling my order order flow? What What is that about? Well, let's start off. So, let's just start off even with Robinhood. So Robinhood's claim to fame is that you pay zero fees for trades. Yeah. Boom. Done. What a benevolent institution. And they call themselves just, Robinhood because it allows you to pay zero for trades. Yeah. Yeah. It turns out they actually need to earn money to pay app developers and make sure you get statements and work with the SEC and have compliance. All those people require payment for their services along the way. So you have to understand that even though there's a free option here, they've got to be doing something else, right? To generate the uh, generate revenue, keep the firm afloat. It's funny. I, I just started thinking, you know, we have our Friday FinTech segment and we tried incredibly hard to get Robin Hood to come on. And I know that they've come on other places, so I can't tell you why they didn't come on. But I do know that one of the questions that we ask every firm that comes on is, how do you make money? And them not coming on, and the reason they gave me for not coming on, like wasn't the standard, like we'll get firms sometimes to say, you know what, we're, we're, can we wait until we've got this big thing going on? Like as an example, uh, yeah, we want to time out the launch to this new service, and then we're going to go on 100 shows, and we'll be on yours, too. Yes, and we'll do that. Yeah. I didn't get that. I just got a, uh, not at this time. Yeah, enough for us. Yeah, and it, and it was really, it was just really strange. But Well, that doesn't make this bad. It doesn't it make it bad. It just makes it a little deceptive, yes. you know, and you got to understand, I think, anytime somebody's selling you something for nothing, it ain't true. You know, one of my favorite saying, I don't say this anymore, but remember when you used to uh, do f- new client meetings and you'd say, hey, Mr. or Mrs. Client, the fee to hire me is X dollars. You know, I'm really looking forward to get started. And they would kind of lean back and cross their arms maybe and say, well, the guy at the bank does it for free. Or I had people that worked for insurance firms that would do it for free. Yeah. Billy down the street, I met with at XYZ insurance company. He said he'll do it for free. I remember asking one woman, I said, do you really think they're doing it for free? And she goes, you don't have any idea how nice this guy is. He is like the nicest guy. He's independently wealthy. That's kind of how I would go through it is say, okay, well, did you meet him in a building? Did he have on its clothes? That's you know, did, was there coffee in the lobby? That's like, so fu- where that, does all of that come from? That's funny you say that because my first question to this woman was, "Oh, he's really did, does he have a family?" She's like, "Oh yeah, he's got three kids. Three he kids. has the nicest spouse. She stays at home with the kids. Oh, really, nice. 
Yeah, did he win the lottery recently, to your knowledge? Yeah, how does he keep a, a roof over fund? their heads? How does he keep a roof over their heads? Hans Taffel. There's no such thing as a free lunch. All right, let's read about how Robinhood may or may not be hosing their clients. <laughs> Uh, The brokerage industry, this piece writes, is split on selling out their customers to high-frequency trading firms. Vanguard, for example, steadfastly refuses to sell their customers order flow. Interactive Brokers, which is a preferred broker for sophisticated retail traders, doesn't sell order flow and allows customers to route orders to any exchange they choose. Robinhood not only engages in selling customer orders, but seems to be making far more than their competitors from it. Among brokers that receive payment for order flow, it's typically a small percentage of their revenue, but a big chunk of change nonetheless, Kane says. This represents a severe breach of confidentiality. This is zero hedge talking. This represents a severe breach of confidentiality for its 4 million active users and a remarkable act of deception from the Silicon Valley firm that promotes ethical trading practices to the benefit of everyday Americans. But as we discovered via Kane's reporting, the company's handsomely profiting from the average person by selling users order flow. Robinhood's website presents millennials with feel good statements and hypocritical statements like invest for free. We believe that the financial system should work for the rest of us, not just the wealthy. We've cut the fat that makes other brokerages costly like manual account management and hundreds of storefront locations. So we can offer zero commission trading. That's all true. By the way, there's nothing not true about that statement. Well, maybe a smidge disingenuous about, it, it, yes. you know. That's because we're like, making tons of money in other we places. We make $280 million a quarter doing this. Yes. But, you Yes, know. because we sell your order flow to these other firms. Yeah, so what exactly is order flow? That is the question that we need to also solve. Why do these high-frequency traders, OG, want to know how you trade? The high-frequency trading thing really kind of came into focus about six years ago. We had that flash crash. Do you remember that phraseology from, from I think, 2011? Yes. Something like this. Let's assume that you have a really fast supercomputer, and you know that Apple is going to announce their earnings tonight. And so you have in your supercomputer two orders. One for, I want to sell a million shares of Apple if the news isn't good, and I want to buy a million shares of Apple if the news is good. And all you got to do is just hit either button. But since your computer is faster than everybody else's, you can get a microscopically smaller price, you know, to the 0.006 or something like that. And everybody else is getting 0.007. And you look at that and you go, okay, well, that's, you know, one thousandth of a cent or something. That's hardly anything. But in aggregate on 100 million shares traded in an instant, boom, you just made 10 million bucks. So when you make a stock trade on a brokerage platform, your broker, whether it's Robinhood or any of the other big ones, Schwab, Merrill, whatever, they have to send that order to a company who processes it. Now imagine if you knew in advance what the vast majority of the orders were that were coming. Could you not use that to your advantage? Or even if you didn't want to use it to your advantage, which arguably sounds illegal, If you knew that I had to position a million shares of Apple stock and I could trade it on your platform or somebody else's and I get a commission for every time I get that done and my commission is 10,000 bucks, how much would I pay to get that $10,000 commission? Would I pay 5,000 to get 10,000? Would I pay nine? I mean, a rational person might suggest they would pay 9,999 to get (laughs) 10,000, you know, if that's the, if, if you pull a lever every time. So that's effectively what's happening here is that these trades are getting batched together. And then the company is saying, okay, who wants them? And how much will you give us for them? What I find very interesting in this article, and the, one of the reasons I wanted to talk about it, was that it's not that they're doing it that's the issue to me. Because as the author mentions, other firms do it as well. It's the way they disclose how they're doing it. And later on in the piece, it talks about how everyone else prices it in dollars per share or cents per share, and they price theirs in dollars per trade or something like that. They use like a different formula. And so when you look at it on paper, it goes, oh, they're at 0.01 and Schwab is at 0.01, but they're using a different multiplier in there. 
And so that tells me that they know exactly what they're doing. You know, it wasn't like a, oh, really? Is that how that's done? Huh. Sorry, our bad. Yeah. You know? Well, well, well. And again, there's nothing wrong with companies making money. Just uh, not telling you, you know, any of this. Well, it's kinda, you know, you got to know that there's no such thing as free lunch and be okay with it. Maybe you're okay with that bad order processing, which is kind of the art, the, the comments. If you read through the article and you look at some of the comments, you know, they say, well, I was looking online and I see the buy and sell price. I see the bid and ask and my number doesn't match up to those. Doesn't and match I just up hit at all. submit. Yeah. Like, why am I, why am I paying a few dollars more or a few dollars less on myself? Mm. Well, that's this reason, you know, it's just, it's just poor order flow. And, and in the small amount of trading that small investors do, I think that a lot of times people just kind of disregard that and go, well, you know, what's the difference? I'm buying one share. I'm off by two bucks. But guess who's getting that two bucks <laughs> times four million accounts? Cha-ching. Boom. Anyway, I have a business idea I want to run by you, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> Kane says there's a material difference in the disclosures between what Robinhood and other discount brokers are showing that suggests that something is going on behind the scenes that we don't understand at Robin Hood. So you, you do the math and the math doesn't add up. Yeah. I think we're going to have more to come here. Don't you? Well, maybe, I mean, this is kind of, this, this was a buried article. I don't know where I found it at, but, uh, maybe again, it is what I, it is. I don't is. think that anything's wrong with it. By right? the way, this it's, is not an old article when you say it's buried, uh, but you're right. Zero hedge is not the type. Of, I mean, we just got in the weeds. We just got in yeah. the weeds and there's a bunch of people, those 4 million people who go, I don't understand any of that. Robin yeah. Hood's making tons of money and you don't understand how it might affect you Yeah, and how you're paying. Yeah. We'll link to that in our show notes at stackybenjamins.com. Our second piece comes to us. Boy, we've got some deep pieces today. Second piece comes to us from Napa Dash Net, the National Association of Plan Advisors the people that manage 401ks, pensions, that kind of thing. Excessive fee suit defendants now seek sanctions against Schlichter. So Schlichter is this law firm. Over the past several years, for those of you that are new to the show, we have had these people suing their 401ks for breach of fiduciary duty. Well, Me we haven't had it, but we've been talking about articles. of. People we've been stuff. talking about these in the headlines, right? Yes. And it seems mm -hmm. like the number of suits coming has escalated, and they're all over the place. Well, we haven't seen this yet, and this is Schlichter, one of the law firms behind a lot of these lawsuits. That because just sounds like a great law firm name, Schlichter. by the way. Schlichter, yes. Yeah. It sounds They're evil, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. Evil law firm Schlichter. The defendants in a suit said, okay, you just sued us? Check this out. Having won their case in court, the targets of a 403B university excessive fee suit are pressing for a federal judge to impose monetary sanctions against the six employee plaintiffs. So the six people who, and I don't know if this is a case, but it has happened like this before, a law firm kind of convinced, hey, I think we got something here, so we should probably take them to court. Six employee plaintiffs and the law firm of Schlichter, Bogart, and Denton LLP that represented them. The suit's been brought by participants in plans of New York University, NYU, one of the first excessive fee suits filed against University 403B plans. I think we did the headline on this uh, particular lawsuit. The plaintiff alleged that NYU's imprudence resulted in losses totaling more than $358 million to the plans, which had over $4.6 billion in combined assets, but had their case rebuffed this past July by Judge Catherine B. Forrest of the U.S. District Court for the Southern District in New York. The NYU defendants now say that sanctions should be imposed against the employees in Schlichter for, quote, filing a duplicative and now a dismissed lawsuit, which plaintiffs and their counsel filed in a blatant attempt to avoid the court's prior rulings, or in the alternative, award defendant its attorney's fees and costs pursuant to ERISA 502 G1 and its motion. And it goes into the exact uh, motion. NYU claims that the factors militate in favor of an award of attorney's fees and cost to defend it specifically that the improper conduct was willful and in bad faith as evidenced by the failure to voluntarily dismiss a second filing when requested by defense counsel, along with a warning that NYU would seek sanctions if plaintiffs did not withdraw that case. So in other words, you bite at NYU, NYU bites back. And this is, this is something you and I have talked about a little bit. 
some of these 401k plans really suck. You can go to Brightscope. You've said this before and check out how good your 401k plan is, your 403b plan. But after you find out that your plan's not that great, I think this is partly why your first move isn't the lawsuit. It's to go to HR with your compadres who are upset about it and seek to make a change from within. That's always the best way to do it. I now routinely include a review of 401k plans as best as we can. A lot of that information is public as part of our retirement planning and reviews is a lot of companies have antiquated and outdated retirement plans and cost structures and that sort of thing. And I look at that and say, it's a great opportunity to be disruptive. There it is. Boom. Yes. In the industry, because there's so many people that are getting hosed, but the right way to do it is not to jump on a law firm. I mean, it might be. It might be. Yeah. I don't want to discount. I don't know what's going on here. I will say at the end of the piece, NYU writes, and once again, this is NYU trying to defend their territory. They said that plaintiff's counsel, i.e. Schlichter, the law firm, and these are NYU's words, is currently counsel for plaintiffs in no fewer than 10 copycat complaints against universities across the country. So there might be OG, there might be something going on here that doesn't have as much to do with the end users in the 403B plans as it has to do with a law firm finding a vein where they think there might be some money. You know. Might be. They're, they're a niche specialty? Are they focusing on their niche? It's could be, I mean, it could be, could be what they do. That marketing parlance for... <laughs> yeah. And sue everybody and see what sticks. Yeah, it's just what we do. Now, it could be that all these 403B funds are bad and NYU needed to be sued. We don't know, but uh, but I don't think that's your first your first move. Uh, I've got one more quick headline here. We normally don't have three headlines. Of course, Ooh. we've got Susie Orman waiting up. Uh, three banger. She can wait. Who is she? Anyway, <laughs> Miss Important. What are you talking about? Yeah. This one comes to us from contactmusic.com. As we were digging around, talking about love and love letters. Of course, there's a musician who you think about immediately. Musician that comes to mind immediately, Barry White. And Okay, and, yep. And and the late Barry White's wife and girlfriend had a big conflict over his estate as well. Oh, these are two different people. Got it. Yes, yeah, they are. Yes. <laughs> yes. Listen to this. The widow and the girlfriend of late Barry White are currently engaged in a fight. Now, this is an old piece, by the way. I, I was just doing research. This is this is from way back. But you hear about all these people having estate issues. Barry White was another one. Following Barry White's death in July 2003 from kidney failure, conflict arose between his wife and girlfriend of the contents of his estate. The widow and girlfriend of late Barry White are currently engaged in a fight over the fortune left behind. White's lover, Catherine Denton, filed a lawsuit against his widow, Glodine James, who is currently in control of the star's estate. This is why you want to get it in writing. Get the stuff in writing because listen, listen to how solvable... Especially if you have a wife and a girlfriend. Well, listen to how, Very sol important. Listen to how solvable this would have been. White and Detton had a daughter together, so White and the girlfriend had a daughter together, one-year-old Bariana. Despite separating from his wife of two decades, several years before he died... So he hadn't been around his wife for several years. They never actually divorced. As White, of course, never left a will. I say, of course, because it seems yeah, to be the rage among everybody. Don't have a will. Um, as he never left a will, his multi-million dollar estate automatically passed to the woman. He hasn't been around right. forever. Yeah. He hasn't been around her forever. In the lawsuit from Denton, she alleges that White promised that she could continue to live in the life of luxury with the expensive gifts he'd given her, including a Chow, a Rolex, and a Lexus. She continued to say that White had told her she would have enough money to live off for the rest of her life and could continue to live in their house in Los Angeles. Denton's lawyers stated that White often referred to her as his fiance, despite his marriage to James. The lawyer stated that this suit is nothing more than a process of fulfilling Barry's expressed intentions and promises. Oh, yes, it is. It is yeah. way more than that. He can say stuff all day if you die without your intentions in writing. Yeah. If you have a wife and a girlfriend, or if you are the wife or the girlfriend, you need to have it in writing. No matter what is 
really going on. And even if he thought in his head he was divorced, the fact that he never got the piece of paper being divorced. Well, then that's interesting. So let's play that out. Then what would have happened? What had, if he was divorced? Well, if he was divorced and he had a girlfriend, then it would have gone to his heirs, which would have been assuming that the daughter he had with his girlfriend is the only child that he has. It would have yeah. gone to the daughter. And it also, depending on the state, might have gone to his siblings. Right. So uh, probably it goes to your direct descendants first. Spouse, if there's no spouse. Daughter was daughter was one year old. One year old. Yeah. So how does that work out from a court standpoint? Is that an easy process or a not easy process for a one-year-old to manage? Two words. Flipping. Well, actually, three words. Flipping, <laughs> dumpster, fire. Yeah. Just just yeah. ugly. All right. I think the lesson there is get it in writing. Our lesson on the excessive fee suit backlash if you don't like your 403B, start off with HR and see if you can change from within. Might uh, be a might be a cleaner way than the lawsuit. And uh, number three here, think you're getting something for free? F- free might might have a different definition than you think it does. I don't know how much time we need to spend introducing this person. If you don't know who Susie Orman is, I will ask you where the heck you've been. And you're about to uh, hear probably one of the most dynamic people in finance today. Susie's been in the financial world for over 40 years. She's been a huge voice, not just for women, but also for investors, for savers. My personal favorite stuff and we probably won't talk about this today, that comes from Susie Orman. If you read anything Susie Orman says, I especially love her thoughts about long-term care and about how important it is to make sure that regardless of how you cover that issue, that you get it covered. I also love how she talks about respect for money, but I love most, OG, she's on her way down to the basement right now. Let's say hello to, and I don't say this lightly, the one and only, Susie Orman. And coming down the stairs to the basement, Susie Orman's here. How are you? I like it down here in this basement. A little cool and drafty and rickety, but I'll take it. I'm just glad you didn't say creepy. That's great. And I'm sure, by the way, this is the highlight of your career. You've been everywhere I know, but finally being on Stacky Benjamin, Susie, I know is great for you. You know, it's going to make my career. I have absolutely no doubt about that. But do you want to know the truth as to why I still to this day will do anything and every request that really comes my way? I'll never forget the time that, you know, years ago now, obviously, but that I would have done anything for anybody to interview me. Just, you know, give me a chance. Come on, just like listen to my voice, whatever. And then your career gets going. And now, you know, you're big wig, which I am. All right. And then you forget about how you started. Well, I'll never forget how I started. And I hope every single one of you who really just wants to start to make a beginning or want something, I wish that for all of you. And so I'll always say yes in a rickety basement, no matter what. <laughs> well, th- then thank you for saying yes to us. I want to get to women and money, and that's such an important topic. But to that point, Susie, I want to ask you about mentors, because in your dedication to the book, you have a great dedication to Esther Margolis taking yeah. a chance on you. Talk a little bit about the role of not just women in money, but mentors in money. Yeah. The real question is, who is your Esther in your life? What was so fabulous for me is that just a few days ago, I gave a women in money talk to a sold out crowd at the Apollo Theater. And standing on that stage has been a dream of mine forever, for many, many reasons. I had everybody in that audience that had something to do with me becoming the Susie Orman that you see today. It was even taped by the Oprah Winfrey Network, because obviously Oprah had a big part in this. Sure. And by the way, that show will be shown October 1st at 8 p.m. on the Oprah Winfrey Network. But Esther was in the audience. And what was so moving was for me to be able to say to her, 
because Esther now is in, I think, her late 80s. And what was so very sad is Esther first recognized potential when every other publisher out there said in 1994, we don't need a finance book by a woman. Women publishers, everybody was like, nah, nah, we don't want that. But Esther saw something in me that I didn't even see myself. And because of Esther, honest to God, I am in front of the world today. Because of Esther, I got QVC, I got onto the TVs, I got onto all these things. And then everybody went, oh, we want her. And so for me to honor her and have her stand up, I think it was the most moving moment of that entire two-hour talk that I gave. And it's what everybody talked to me about afterwards. So the question is, there's somebody in every one of your lives that opened that door for you, that saw something in you that you didn't see in yourself. And it's those connections that you should never forget and you should always honor. You should always somehow pay that forward. So, you know, I don't know if that answered your question, but it was what I wanted to say. Anyway. No, it's it's incredibly powerful. And I think mentors, to your point, just huge and people like Esther in your life and, and letting them in. Because I think a lot of time we don't let those people in our life and we have to. Yeah, you have to know when somebody's being a mentor because they want the most for you versus they want the most for themselves. You have to be careful of that. You first wrote Women and Money in 2007, and it seems like yesterday for me, 2007, but a lot's changed between now and then, Susie. What's changed that made you say, you know what, we need a revised edition to this book? Actually, it's not only we need a revised edition, but you know, I retired three years ago. I live on a private island now. I spend my time fishing, being the captain of my own boat, and having really the most extraordinary life you could ever imagine. And I earned the right to do that. And, you know, I'm 67 years of age as I talk to you right now. About a year ago, when the Me Too movement started, I started to think to myself, why? Why did, and I know a lot of these men that absolutely violated these women. And you have to ask yourself the question, why did women say yes? And the answer to that question, not in every case by any means, but in many of the cases, they needed the job, they needed the promotion, they needed the part, they needed the, you know, whatever it may be. And why did they need it? They needed it, in my opinion, to make money to pay for their family's needs. And when a woman you know, needs to take care of her family, financially speaking, she will do anything to do that. And so I realized that it's one thing to give women a voice to start saying, me too, it happened to me, it happened to me. And for other women to see what happened to other women that haven't happened to them yet. But if you really want to also make it so that women are in a position to say no, may give them a financial voice. Give them a way, like in the Women in Money book does, give them the financial empowerment plan that shows women, you know, how to protect themselves, how to save for their future, how to build a future, all these things. Well, to your point, Susie, you write about your first job in 1980, and now 40 years later, uh, you write that the story is often much the same. You say, regardless of the gains in our financial status, I know and you know that many women still don't want to take responsibility once it comes to their money. Yes, women are making more money than ever before, but they're not making more of what they make. Yes, that's true. You know, I have many famous friends who have made a lot of money. You know what they always say to me? I don't have it. Yeah, I made it. I don't know where it is. Yeah, I have it. Some manager has it. And then a few months later, I find out that their manager has taken advantage of them. Just because you have money does not mean that you have power over your money. And you know who taught me that? Was Miss Oprah Winfrey. I can remember the 29 times that I was on her show, the one-hour shows. There were times when we would talk about things and she would say, you know, Susie, I still sign all my checks to this day. Wow. Susie, this is what my electrical bill is at this house that I just bought. Drives me crazy, Susie. And I'm sitting there thinking, here's this billionaire who still takes the time to look at everything and stay involved with her money. Now, that's a woman who's powerful over her own money. 
You have women out there who make a lot of money and they cannot tell you, women, listen to me right now and just tell me if it's true. What is your retirement account? What type of retirement account do you have? Can you tell me? Can you tell me what do you own within your retirement account? Can you tell me the interest rate on your mortgage? How many years you have left? Can you tell me if you have life insurance? What type of life insurance do you have? Can you tell me how you hold title to your homes? Do you have a will? Do you have a trust? Do you have an advanced directive and durable power of attorney for health care? Are you saving for your kids' college education? If so, how are you doing it? And can you even afford to be saving for their college education because you don't have an eight-month emergency fund or anything else? And on and on. Ladies, can you answer those questions for me? Because if you cannot and you are bringing home a paycheck, you are still rendering yourself powerless because you're never going to be powerful in life until you're powerful over your own money, how you think about it, feel about it, and invest it, know about it, and spend it. You say in your new introduction to the book that actually writing this book at first, and tell me if I got this right, was because of friends of yours. And you tell this great story. Well, it's a horrible story about a friend of yours who let her will and trust documents sit there for, what was it? You said th- like three years. years? Yeah. And as, so when I originally wrote that intro, that was in 2007, asked me if that woman to this day has done it. And the answer to that is no. Oh my God. I have, I have a niece who makes a serious sum of money being a vet. She's married. She owns a home now. And she has a kid. Do you know what I had to do to get her to even look at my will and trust kit that I have and all this stuff and to do it? It was like, I was almost at the point where if you do not do this within, and this was months going on, if you do not do it right away, I'm going to change my trust and you're going to feel the sting of that one day, girlfriend. (laughs) And so it's, I don't know why we don't do that, which we know we should do with money, but the time has changed. The time now, you know, is here and within the book. There are links and there's all kinds of things for you to be able to download the course for free and do this for free and to find a way to get your must-have documents and to follow the financial empowerment plan. It's all there in this book. This book is fabulous, fabulous. A number one New York Times bestseller, millions out there. It was time to rewrite it for today, for today's woman. I don't have you for long today, so I just want to dig a little bit into one of the chapters And by the way, I love, and we're not going to have time to get to it today, but the whole chapter about you are not for sale, I think is a must read for women, men, everybody. You are not, that's such a great message. But you talk about in the next chapter, eight qualities of wealthy women. And I'd like to, if we could just peel back a couple of those in our, in what we have left, you say you begin with harmony and balance are the first two qualities of a wealthy woman. Actually, the first three are harmony, balance, and courage. Listen, ladies, you know and I know that you say yes out of fear of what other people are going to think about you or feel about you versus no out of love for yourself. You know that you give more of yourself than you give to yourself. Women, you also know that you think one thing and you say another, you feel one thing, yet you do another. You know that. You know what I am talking about. Somebody wants to borrow $5,000 from you that you already lent them $5,000 a few years ago and they never paid you back. And you are thinking, I don't want to do that. You're feeling, are you crazy? And yet you give them $5,000. So you say yes out of fear of what others will think about you versus no out of love for yourself. It is essential that there are eight qualities of a wealthy woman. And the first three are this, harmony. What you think, say, and do has got to be one. You cannot say yes when you are feeling like, no, I don't want to. Or you have to be one with what you think, say, and do. Because if you're not, You are out of balance and balance is really important to yourself. You know, when you're off balance, somebody can come up and push you and you kind of fall over. But when you have two feet planted firmly on the ground with everything, because you're in harmony with your thoughts, feelings, and actions, you're one and you're strong and both feet are planted perfectly on the ground together, both strength 
both strong, both there for you. Somebody pushes you, they do not budge you. But to do that, you need courage. You need courage to say what you are thinking, to do what you are feeling, to think of yourself, to make yourself a priority. And you might be thinking to me, but Susie, isn't that selfish? No, you have got to take care of yourselves. You know, when you're on the airplane and you hear when the oxygen ass falls down, <laughs> please put it on your face first, then your kids. The reason that they say that is because your tendency is to take care of your kids. But if something happens to you, what's going to happen to your kids? So the financial oxygen mask needs to be placed on your face first. The same is true. So those are three of the eight qualities of a wealthy woman. I love, by the way, reading when it comes to fear and having courage that even you, even Susie Orman has fought fe- You've You fought fear a ton of times in your life. Yeah. You know, I'm 67 years of age. In those years, I have faced every possible person trying to tear me down you know what's so sad is everybody wants you to make it until you make it. And then when you've made it, everybody wants to tear you down. Other women as well. It's not just a male thing. It is just the nature of things. So I've been afraid. I've been like, but that's not true. They wrote this about me and it's not true. And there's some whack job out there who has this video. The, uh, there's just whack jobs. Try, people you don't even know that have pasted videos together and tapes together and all these things And they make it seem like you're their best friend that's just out to destroy you for whatever reason. And you get afraid of things. I'm not afraid of anything anymore right now, I have to tell you. Although I was afraid to do the, you know, women and money event at the Apollo the other day. I bet. (laughs) That was something walking out to three balconies filled with people. Like I've spoken to 200,000 people at a time, 100,000 But there was something so special about the Apollo. I don't know. It was just like, oh, my God. Maybe it was because there were five cameras and it was for (laughs) Oprah. And I never want to displease her. But And it's the Apollo. I mean, it's the Apollo. And I walked out and I got to rub the tree of hope. Oh, how great is that? The tree of hope. Again, remember October 1st on the Oprah Winfrey Network at 8 p.m. You can all watch it. Don't please. I'll say it over and over again. It was so (laughs) fabulous. Probably only second year career to being on Stacking Benjamins, I'm sure, Susie. Probably. Maybe third or fourth. Steph, like, you know, you guys, you're up there. You're up there. I'm looking at you. I, yeah, but cute, that little bald head of yours. Uh, oh, no. Oh, and look at his turning red now. You got to stop I, that. Uh, Imo, you are shiny. <laughs> you need a makeup artist. I want to ask you something, Susie, before we go. Last question and then talk about where people can get the book. But, but I want to ask you this because, you know, 2007, when you first wrote this book, the world was obviously changing. The markets were, people, I mean, you remember this time, nobody had any clue what was going on. But during that time, here's what I missed. Was it during that time, I had my BFF Susie Orman on TV that I could watch and get comfort from you helping people on TV. We had what, Clark Howard on TV. We had some of my favorite TV personalities. And I felt like during that downturn, everybody just went away. And I think And tell me if this is right or not, because I've never proven this or or I don't know that the reason why all of these financial healthy shows went away was I felt like as the market turned down, people started thinking, well, if I don't look at it anymore, like all these problems won't exist anymore. So then rankings go down, ratings go down. And obviously then all the shows just kind of disappear because we don't have any of that stuff. Listen, I don't know why the other shows disappeared, but my show stayed on for 14 years. Yeah. I was on till I think 2014, 15, one of the two. Yeah. And the only reason that my show stopped is because I told CNBC it was time. It was time after 14 years. You know something? When you tell people how to be, you better know who you are. And I wanted to know that everything that I was telling people to be and everything that I was saying to do with your money – How does that relate to me when I no longer have standing ovations, three cameras on me all the time, all these homes, all this stuff? So I stopped writing for the Oprah Winfrey magazine. I stopped doing PBS specials. I stopped doing the Susie Orman show. I stopped every single thing, giving talks. I stopped everything that I was doing. I even stopped QVC. I'd put it all down. I didn't need the money. 
I have more than money, more money than I'll ever be able to spend in my life. And you would expect me to have that since if I haven't done that, why should you be listening to me? <laughs> you know, I made it from a waitress to here. I wasn't born with it. I didn't marry it. So that's my career. You know, I was a waitress till I was 30 years of age, people. I didn't write my first book till I was 45. And I didn't have my first TV show till I was like 50, something like that. The point being here is that I just wanted to know who I was without all those things. You know, the last chapter of, of Women and Money is Say Your Name. Who are you if all you are is Susie Worman? So I moved to a private island in the Bahamas where there are no cars, you fish, there's nothing to do on there. And for three years, I loved my life. And I still love my life there. That is still where I live. But when the Me Too movement started, that's when I wanted to come back. Because in my opinion, there's only one Susie Orman. And maybe, you know, that doesn't sound very humble to you, but I believe it with my entire soul. I don't want anything from you anymore, but I sure want a lot for you. And I want to be your teacher. I want to be the money matriarch that I now am at 67 years of age, because you don't go through 35 and 40 years of up markets, down markets, being a true financial advisor, sitting behind a desk, watching all of these things happen, not just the crash in 2007, but in 1993 and 1982, all the things that I've been through, all the licenses that I've held, my own financial firm, my own planning of everybody thing. You don't go through that. And you don't learn every single thing that you need to know. And so while there may be other voices out there that are entertaining and nice, there is no Susie Orman. So now I've started again the Women and Money podcast with Westwood One, obviously on iTunes, and we're going to start up again and you'll find it everywhere. Go to SusieOrman.com awesome. and you'll find those things. But my voice, in my opinion, is needed again. And when I feel like I am needed, I show up. I'm so happy that we have your voice, Susie. I absolutely love it. I'm so happy you spent 20 minutes here with us today. The book is called Women and Money. You can find it everywhere, correct? Yeah, but here's the bottom line. If you have credit card debt, don't you dare go out there and buy that book. You could simply go to the library and take it out so that one day you live the life that you deserve to live, a powerful life where you can retire, where you don't have to worry about money, where you don't have credit card debt, where your kids feel secure, where you have all the documents in place and you are happy. Spoken like Susie Orman, I wish you were fired up a little bit. You know, I'm, it's early still where I am, what can I tell you? <laughs> Thanks for hanging out with us. By the way, if you're on your way to work, you're on your commute, you're walking the dog, whatever, we've got you covered. We'll have the links to everything Susie talked about on our show notes page at stackybedjamins.com. Susie, so great to hear you. Stay out of trouble. I doubt it. <laughs> Me too. Hey there, trivia fans. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And how about that Susie Orman, huh? I think someday with that vocal presence of hers, she might just become a big name in personal finance. I think she's got a real shot. But hey, back to the real big name on this show, me and my amazing trivia segment. Today is Love Note Day, and to celebrate, let's share some love-related trivia. What popular travel company's ticker symbol, the symbol you use to buy the stock, are the letters L-U-V? I'll be back with the answer in just a moment. Huge thanks to Emperor Investments for supporting Stacking Benjamins. Emperor Invest, a new tech-driven investment platform looking to shake up the investing space, is offering everybody in the basement personalized all-equity portfolios fee-free, get this, for six months. Emperor's portfolios comprise some of the largest and best-known dividend-paying U.S. companies, and Emperor Investments is a lifestyle investment company. They get that investors have different goals and dreams, a new home, a dream vacation, retirement, and more. And the Emperor platform creates customized portfolios designed specifically to help you meet those life goals. In fact, if you want a little in-depth discussion about that, Brenna and Francis, the co-founders of Emperor Investments, were on the show recently. Just go back into the archives and find this if you want to dig in and hear them personally. 
We're so happy they're sponsoring the show because so many people have no investment philosophy when they go pick stocks. And yet Brenna and Francis, huge, reliable. And by the way, when you take a look at back testing and performance, I think you're going to be happy there too. Emperor invests solely in individual dividend paying stocks, giving clients tailored portfolios. And to take advantage of this exclusive offer, an all equity portfolio for you fee free for six months, visit emperorinvest.com forward slash SB. It's not Emperor Investments, it's emperorinvest.com slash SB and select Stacky Benjamin's podcast under How Did You Hear About Emperor during sign up. That's emperorinvest.com dot com forward slash S B. Thanks also to magnify money for being our longest time sponsor of the stacky Benjamin show. And there's a reason why we align ourselves with magnify money. And yes, it's because they have an award-winning blog. And yes, it's because Mandy Woodruff from the Brown ambition podcast is a fantastic editor in chief over there. And yes, it's because Nick Clements worked in the credit card industry and knows all the games they play. Putting all that together, though, what you find is one site that has the best of all worlds, where you can very quickly look at all of the banking products that you use every day, compare and contrast them against each other, and come away with something that you know is best in class. As an example, when we take a look at different savings accounts that are out there, not only does Magnify Money feature well over 90% of all the things that you can buy on the internet when it comes to savings accounts, but also they grade the fine print score. They tell you what the minimum deposit is. They give you the APY and better yet, they even give you user reviews about people that have been through the process. But it's not just about savings accounts. If you're trying to pay less debt to the man, you can look at balance transfers, 0% credit cards. And let's say you pay your bills in full. How about cash back rewards? On the other side, personal loan, student loan refinance, parent plus loan refinance, auto loans, small business loans, private student loans, it's all there. When it comes to calculators, Magnify Money has a ton of them. How much house can you afford? The personal loan calculator, snowball versus avalanche calculator, credit card payoff, student loan refinance, a money personality quiz, and more. Check it out at stackybenjamins.com forward slash magnify money a much better place than your local bank if you're going to compare, ditch, switch, and then save a bunch of money. Hey there, trivia fans. Miss me? (laughs) I missed you too, which is why I'm back with this love letter of a trivia answer. The question was this, What popular travel company's ticker symbol, the symbol you use to buy the stock, are the letters L-U-V? Well, known for being a playful company, the Dallas-based Southwest Airlines uses ticker symbol L-U-V when you want to trade. Trade? Speaking of trade, I'm going to trade in this microphone right now to go grab some of Joe's mom's leftover meatloaf. Mm -hmm. See ya! Thanks again to Susie for dropping by. I'm glad to hear her say out loud that this is probably one of the pinnacle moments of her career. Oh, gee. I think we we probably, as Doug said, we can help her someday become a star. Yeah. I mean, when she wants to really take off, when she wants her career to take off. um, That's why she finally made it here. She'll... uh I mean, I know... She'll be on again. I know what she said about the reason she needed to come back, but I think we heard the rest of that. Yeah. Got to come on Stacking Benjamins. Have to. I love those names, by the way. All the cool kids are. Getting to uh, Doug's trivia. Don't you love creative ticker symbols? Uh, No, I'm not in love with them. Sorry. Oh, I just think it's so fun. Come on. Southwest Airlines, Harley, Mm -hmm. right? I think Harley's is fun. Harley's is H-O-G. Cedar Fair, the parent company of Cedar Point, Knott's Berry Farm is F-U-N. I mean, I, I don't know. I think companies that play with that a little bit think it's a good time. Mm. You know what else is a good time? Throw out the Haven Lifeline. Let's throw that out now. And we're going to tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, they put what you value first. Well, in honor of you, I will say flying Southwest and riding Harleys. There you go. It's your family and your time. But Because you ride Harleys all the time. <laughs> I don't, but mom does, as you know. Leather chaps. Yes, mom does. 
it's your loved ones and your time. It's why they've made buying quality term life insurance actually simple. Head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash Haven Life now to get a free quote. No waiting for several weeks for a decision. Lovely customer support. I love the online life insurance calculator for people who aren't sure what they need because they give you a range and life insurance is a range. Stackybenjamins.com forward slash Haven Life. And today we're throwing out the lifeline to our new friend, Martin. Say hi, Martin. Hi, Joe and OG. My question today is about getting a home mortgage. I'm doing research into the home buying process for my first home. My wife and I currently rent the basement of a house with the in-laws upstairs. So far, we've survived. However, the prospect of waiting another two years before I'm eligible for a loan doesn't seem appealing. Why the two years? I just switched from a W-2 job to a job that is a partnership, and I'm being told by lenders that I need two full years of tax returns with the K-1 income. We are not actively looking for a house at the moment. We are still saving, but that's a long time. Since we moved in May, and that's when I took this job, two full years puts us at December 2020, and with filing taxes into 2021, any alternatives to renting with the in-laws for three years? Please help. Thanks. I got to say, basement living, Martin, pretty darn good. I know. It's not so bad. What are you worried about, man? <laughs> it's a, it's a stick with the gravy train. No, you, mm-hmm. can, you can hear it in his voice. It's fine now. Hey, guys. It's awesome. I'm a big fan. I live in here. So grateful <laughs> to my in-laws for letting us sleep in their basement there's not that much water so that's good Some, um, somebody shoot me <laughs> shoot. there's even a i've asked for an egress window in case there's a f- accident but apparently they're too expensive to install after the house is built there's a little sliver of natural light the good news is three times three times three times a day the good news is they get canary- a tray of food kicked down the stairs <laughs> the canary's still hanging on that's the good news, but just barely. I took my first paycheck, and I bought a bird just in case. <laughs> Please, for the love of God, help me. <laughs> Martin, let's, let's help Martin get out of there. Two years, OG. The reason that they say you need two years is because they're going to average your income for those two years. So if your job makes you... $300,000 a year and you have a K1 that says 300 for year one, they're going to look at that or at least some banker will. You might not, I mean, you have to look, but some banker will just say, listen, we're only going to count half of this because we got to average it over two years, 300 times, you know, divided by two. Now that could be okay if you're making a whole bunch of money because you still qualify for a loan. If your income is more normal, I guess, than $200,000, $300,000, $400,000 a year, you may run into a problem from a qualification standpoint by taking your annual income and dividing it by two. But that's not your only out. Why don't you move into another apartment? There's that. You could rent an apartment somewhere like across the country, way far away from your in-laws. Then you don't have to worry about when you buy a house, which is probably what I would do, frankly. I might be gracious and stay for a little while and then go, Hey, it's our time to move on, you know, but some of this is just going to boil down to, you know, your individual needs on the house front. If you're talking about buying a hundred thousand dollar house that requires a $600 monthly payment and your K one for next year is a hundred grand, you'll probably still qualify for it. The best place to look for this stuff, by the way, I think is working with a local financial institution as opposed to the big Going right where I was headed. That's your only prayer of getting this done quicker. Yeah. I mean, it's still going to be a pain in the butt. Yes. You know, mortgage, because our income is variable too, being entrepreneurs, ours took a long time to get done. It took 90 days for them to get through all the weeds to sign off on it. But once they did, they were happy with it. I was happy with the offer. And they keep that loan in-house. So because the credit union that we dealt with is keeping the loan on their books, they don't have to adhere to the same FHA standards and stuff like that to be able to resell the loan. So the credit union 
has their own approval department, you know, that look at the character of a person and the trajectory and that sort of thing, which is probably your best bet at this point, uh, or just move to another apartment. Yeah. When we moved from Michigan to Texarkana, uh, we started working with a local bank and a local baker who knew us and we've taken unconventional financing on several projects while interest rates were low just because I could leave my money in savings, earning a much better rate, and have a have a low cost loan, but it was all because of the fact that I had a personal relationship with a local banker who knew inside and out our situation. And I understand as I get ready to move away from that, like how flipping lucky that is, and how most people do not have that opportunity. So going to a local bank. I think is job one. But I also like that other idea. I think the halfway thing where you leave the basement, but maybe, you know, just because he wants to move out of the basement and let's say he can't find another way around it. Maybe he rents someplace that he likes a little better for a year. And the cool thing about renting moving sucks, but the cool thing about renting is, is that different than signing on to a new mortgage, the cost to do that really can be pretty close to painless. And if you find the right, uh, the right rental situation, you still end up, you know, not paying for a bunch of the fees and the upkeep that you're going to pay for with your new house. So maybe there's yeah, what's a- wrong with renting a house that's similar to the style and size that you want to ultimately buy. Yeah. Maybe there's um, a halfway point, I guess is my, mm-hmm. is my feeling. Yeah. I would also add that the more you know about the process and I'm not talking about the, Hey, I need to have X years of W-2 versus K-1 or whatever the case may be. I'm talking about the ratios that the banks use, knowing, okay, how do they calculate this? How do they, what are they going to count here? What are they not going to count? When they look at your tax return, what are the things that they're going to add back or, or not? One of the things I observed as we went through this some time ago was even though we were working with the local institution, they still have their formulas to go through. And the more that I could help them and educate them on our unique financial situation and how we didn't necessarily fit into each box correct, you know, the way that they wanted to, but here's how I adjusted that. I knew, for example, that the maximum that they would let us borrow was a payment equal to 43% of our gross income. I also knew that they counted the HOA fee and I knew that they counted the insurance. So when they, when they said, Hey, uh, you're over our number, I could go through and go, well, what did you use for homeowners insurance? Oh, we used this amount. I go, no, no, no. I've already quoted it. Here's the number that I got. You know, so I could plug in my, here's the real, the real number. Yeah. Yeah. Here's what we assume for taxes. No, no, no. This is the real tax calculation because I wanted that number to be exact and, and we got it to exactly the number. So the more that you can know about how they're getting the data, the better you are as well. But, um, look locally and frankly, Hey, two years is nothing anyway. And you should be so lucky to have somebody that helps you out. Just suffer in silence, Martin. Nobody wants to hear you complaining about your free <laughs> living <laughs> situation. <laughs> if you feel so if you feel so uneasy, you can send me some money and I'll you can I'll show you what it really is like to pay a mortgage payment. No, seriously, if you want to hear somebody whine, sit across from OG three yeah. days a week. Yeah. Living the dream, baby. Living yep. the dream, yeah. Why don't you work more, and then you're out of the house more, <laughs> and then you can make more money. You know, attack the problem from both ends. You know, go get be an Uber driver. You know, and then at night clean offices or something. You could be gone almost twenty hours a day if you structure this out correctly. If you get it, yeah. Look at it. it's consider it an opportunity. That's what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, what a great what Oh, a great that's great. Hey, uh, unfortunately, because we did three headlines, we got in the weeds with Robin Hood and, of course, had the amazing Susie Orman on. We're not going to have time for a letter from the mailbag. We're going to have a mailbag uh, episode, I think, coming up, OG, because we're getting a little behind there. Okay. But the big thanks to everybody for listening today. Also, thanks to everybody who hung out with us yesterday in Orlando. Also need to take a little minute for that. This is the first time we've done this, guys, and it's so exciting to meet people around the country, whether it's been Seattle, Philadelphia, Maine, uh, going there, or last night in Orlando was just an absolute blast. So thanks a ton to everybody who came out. And I think, uh, Orlando, you'll agree, Kansas City, you better be ready because we're bringing it. We're bringing it. We get this van started someday. (laughs) Well, we push it down the hill 
to start it, and hopefully it's got enough juice to make it up the hill. On Just the pop side. the clutch, and uh, hopefully the baby starts. You know, you you ever do that? Nope, I have never it, that never must... had to experience the. Uh, hopefully, let's get this baby rolling, and there are maybe few... it'll kickstart itself. Is that, that is that the same equivalent of the crank in the front of the car? There are few phrases that help me get recognized for the redneck I really am. <laughs> Then roll, one of them is pop the clutch roll it down a hill and pop the clutch <laughs> yeah not, ding, 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 ding. yeah not great uh thanks also to people who have left reviews of this show of this review i can't remember where we left off but mom recently had this one on the fridge uh this comes to us from mtb 207 entertaining and very informative five stars thanks joe og and doug for the excellent info mixed with a dose of silliness i'm hooked on this podcast thanks a ton and uh, if you can leave a review wherever you listen to the show, that helps people understand what they're getting into when they listen to Stacking Benjamins. All right, that's going to do it for today. Doug, what should we have learned today? So what did we learn today? First, take some advice from new kid on the block, Susie Orman, and take control of your money. Ask smart people to be your mentor. Find out the details of your money situation, and you'll be successful in no time. Second, leaving money to beneficiaries? Don't make the mistake Barry White made. Write down what you want in a will or a trust, whatever. Just write it down. But the big lesson? Don't offer Susie Orman a ride in your El Camino until you cleaned it. Apparently, that woman is a real stickler for details like clean seats and air freshener and floor mats that don't stick to your shoes man she's a little high maintenance special thanks to Susie orman for dropping by you'll find her book yeah you know what you're just you're gonna find it everywhere apparently she's actually a really big deal but you're also gonna find more tools at her aptly named site suzyorman.com this show was created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Richie Rutter Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at, at @sbenjaminscast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I just jumped the shark. SB Podcast may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remuneration. There's no way you would take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only, and before making any financial moves, consult with a real financial advisor. We quote investment news quite a bit here on the show, but <laughs> this Liz Skinner brings it. There's nothing funnier in the universe Skinner, than financial planning jokes. Okay. <laughs> There's 5,000 things. Like if you want a great time, become a financial planner and go to the holiday party. I'll tell you, <laughs> Cheryl, blue tuxedo. Cheryl went one year. And <laughs> after that, she's like, no, I'm busy that night. Why don't yeah. you go without me? Yeah. Like just- and then I said, super Roth. <laughs> <laughs> I told him if we stay in the 25% tax bracket, we'd do better next year. Oh, it's amazing, Lou. Yeah, just uh, not, not, not great. But for those of you that are financial planners, I can see you nod your head. Just not great. Yep. So the best new financial advisor jokes that we'd run through these and 
I haven't read them yet. I read, well, I lie. I read the first one and I'm like, we're just going to, we're just going to see if these work or not on the show. Okay. Bring it. A couple in their late nineties announced to their advisor that they're going to get a divorce. Advisor looks at him and goes, but you've been married 60 years. Why now? They said, we wanted to wait till the kids died. A couple of answers. <laughs> not that good. Huh? Okay. We wanted to wait till, the, you know. We, we, yeah. Yeah. I get it. We stayed yeah. together for the kids. Yeah. Yeah. I got it. Yeah. Not that great. That's uh, terrible. A chemist, an engineer, and an economist are stranded on a deserted island. They carry with them some canned food, but have no ordinary means of opening the cans. The chemist suggests gathering some wood and starting a fire and then holding the cans over the heat, counting on the expanding contents to burst open the cans. The engineer thinks it'd be better to try smashing the cans open with some rocks. The economist begins, assume we had a can opener. Hmm. <laughs> Just not good. This is what it's like at a financial planning holiday meeting right here or holiday party. Maybe this is a party. Uh, how about this one? A stockbroker was filling out a job application when he came to the question, have you ever been arrested? He answered no to the question. The next question intended for those who answered the preceding question with a yes was why? Nevertheless, the stockbroker answered it, never got caught. There you go. That's, that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. That's, that's pretty, uh, pretty good. Next. Just got some good news for my financial planner. He told me I'd only have to keep working five years after I die to afford my retirement. That's pretty good. That's not okay. bad. Well, it's not terrible. No, that's probably the best of the bunch. Roy was a single guy living at home with his father, working in the family business. When he found out he was going to inherit a fortune when his sickly father died, he decided he needed a wife to share his fortune with. And one night at an investment meeting, he spotted the prettiest woman he'd ever seen. I may look like just an ordinary man, he said to her, but in just a few years, my father will die and I'll inherit $200 million. Impressed, the woman obtained his business card and three weeks later, she became his stepmother. There you go. <laughs> I saw that coming from a mile away. She was far smarter than he was. Hmm. The most successful investor ever was Noah. He floated stock while everything around him went into liquidation. Uh, 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 oh, but seriously, he's here. We end this. Oh, we, oh, there's three more. Oh God! A pre America. Okay. A preacher went into his church and he was praying to God. While he was praying, he asked God, "How long is a hundred million years to you?" God replied, "One second." The next day, the preacher asked God, "God, how much is ten million dollars to you?" And God replied, "A penny." Then finally, the next day, the preacher asked God, God, can I have one of your pennies? And God replied, just wait a sec. Huh. That one was horrible. Number two, why did the bank robber only steal 1% of the bank's money? He was a financial advisor. Hmm. Not good. And the last one, the stock market's weird. Every time one guy sells, another one buys, and they both think they're smart. That one's true. That one's not even That's funny. That is true. That is absolutely true. Yeah. Thanks for the jokes, Liz. Uh, that's, that's your glimpse into life at a financial planner holiday party right there. 